Good afternoon. This is Dorothy White with Channel 6, and I'm so glad to be with you this afternoon for Community Focus. And we have a community-minded person here with us today, Miss Dixie Hibbs. And I know Dixie, over the years, I think you have filled so many shoes in our community that we can focus on any one of those that you like. But I think we'd like to start with Wicklin, since that's been your most recent uh, you know, adventure. adventure. And I could not believe that when I read that you were there more than a decade. Yes, I went in in May of 19, excuse me, 2007. 2007. 2007, wow. and I have just resigned or retired. Retired. Like retired. Let's say retired. Retired, yes. Well, I've retired from the day to day operation of Wickland. I have not okay. retired from talking about Wickland. Okay. And today, when you asked me to come and we talked to Wickland, I, we always love to talk about pictures. I'm going to talk about Wickland for a while. Then I'm going to talk to you about how you can go out and find history about your home, your family, community, and things like that, sure. and kind of fill in the blocks, uh, the holes maybe that we've got on history. Yeah. One of the first things that people always love about Wickland are these beautiful big pictures we have of yes. the house. Solid brick construction. It was built in 1826 to 28. It has, um, it's a, a Georgian design, and Georgian design is very balance. So in our case, you had the main front door, mm -hmm. then you have two windows on each side, yes. and over the front door you've got a window, a, big, a wider window, a palladium window they call about. Well that's part of the Georgian design. And you notice it doesn't have a front porch. Many of the homes in our community have front porches, big front porches. Well, I used to tell people that a porch salesman came through and sold everybody a porch in 1910. I remember that. But that isn't exactly what happened. What happened it was the new houses they were building in the 1890s, early 1900s, they had porches, and people were sitting on porches and watching yeah. people go by. And enjoying that. That's right. Well, the earlier houses never had them. The mm -hmm. design didn't have them. And so uh, the idea that we have some very young, old houses, 1820s, 1830s, and 50s, yeah. and they all have these big porches. And they look like they might have been there all along, but I just shake my head, no. That was a, that was a 1910 porch. Now how about a side porch? Did some of them, side I porches, know that, yes, that big mansion did. downtown has a very nice side porch to it. It's all open, it's that one. You, uh, can, you do right? have side porches. Yes. You normally don't have two-story porches. Oh, okay. Now I'll say that and then I have to back up. Uh, there's a design uh, that uh, some of the plantation houses would have the two-story front porches. Uh -huh. They don't go all the way across. They're right there by the front door and right okay. above it. Now that usually is in the 1840s and later kind of thing. But uh, our what we call our Georgian, like uh, the, um, yes, the, uh, in fact, we look at here at, at things, we look at the, uh, the same picture, basically, mm -hmm. but a different time. Mm -hmm. This one we think is around uh, 1920, doesn't have a price of 1920, mm -hmm. and it has a, a little wooden strip across the, uh, the roof line. Uh -huh. And this roof shows that it has wooden shingles. Mm -hmm. Now today you'd think, we put wooden shingles on on Till Ice Resort, yeah. but uh, it's a decorative thing. But then, that was what Wick would have had from the very beginning, was mm -hmm. wooden shingles. Now later they would go back, they would take that strip off, they kept the snow from the ice from sliding down, uh -huh. and they would put regular, just plain regular shingles. Okay. Mm -hmm. So this is really what it looks like today. Right. Uh, the, um, today we do have the upstairs closed. You see where we closed them? Mm -hmm. That's been closed for some time. In this picture, and this is 1949, it's open. And in 1949, Dr. Walter Wright owned it. He and his wife had bought it in like 1941, uh -huh. and they op they opened it to the public. They actually oh, they did open it to the public yes. way back then. I didn't realize that. Oh yeah, they wanted the actually uh -huh. were operating um, not an antique shop, but they did have a little gift shop. He was a world traveler, and they had wonderful antique furniture. Oh, wow, lots of mementos and things. So this was an open door for people to come in and visit. And but the the problem with the opening up at that time. It was during the Second World War, and there was no gasoline. So people that wanted to come see it didn't have, didn't have the ability to get gasoline to drive around. Mm -hmm. Our tourism really suffered then, I have to tell you. Oh, my God. Uh, but after the war was over, he opened it up. He had been promoting it in the antiques magazines and things all during the war. And after the war was over, he opened it up, and he had lots of travelers. Mm -hmm. And that's really where the name, uh, the Home of Three Governors, came from. 
when he was promoting it that it's one. One family, three governors. Oh, okay. All right. We go back to Charles Anderson Wycliffe, who was the first man who built it. He and his wife Margaret would build it. I said 1826 to 28. We know it took two years. Mm -hmm. John Rogers, the same architect who would design and build St. Joseph Cathedral, built this house. There's lots of details inside that have Rogers touch on them. Alexander Moore, his master carpenter, master craftsman, he would oversee the uh, apprentices and the workmen that were doing all the wonderful woodwork. And wow. Wicklin's woodwork is beautiful. It is just incredible. It is that, all handmade, of course. Mm -hmm. We didn't quite have the, all the equipment we have now to make those things. And it's all stood up well over time, over the, the use of the house for many, many years. It'll be 200 years soon, another one. It's eight years, it'll be 200 mm -hmm. years old kind of thing. Well, I know folks were awful glad when you took over. It, you do need people in a building, mm -hmm. in any, uh, any modern building or, or an old building. Mm -hmm. And in this case, uh, the fiscal court of, of Nelson County bought the house. They're mm -hmm. the owners. And I like to say that the citizens of Bardstown are the owners. Mm -hmm. This is a view on the side, what they call the I garden know, I side. I like that. I, I know I've been to a wedding there before, and it is absolutely beautiful. The weddings are beautiful. If someone is looking for a wedding venue, uh, they certainly are able to right. still do that. We already have uh, 10 weddings booked for next year. Oh, my goodness. And what season is the most popular? Well, April and October. April and October. Mm -hmm. so. so I have a, a couple in June, and, but, uh, and we do have a lot of people don't want to be in July and August. They think it's hot. But we have one in September, and I think there's four in October, and on like that. Mm -hmm. So, but it is—it's a wedding. We have can we have weddings inside, or we can have them outside. Mm -hmm. A lot of people like to have an outside wedding, and sometimes the couples don't want to be married in a church, but they want to have uh, a nice setting and they sure. plenty of room. And there is plenty of room there. We've had three and four hundred people there at weddings and receptions. Kind of now, do they ever use the large staircase? Well, comes yes, down in fact, because uh, that's so beautiful. I just love that part. There's a picture here, I think. You oh, see? Oh, yes. Mm -hmm. yes. That shows the front hall. And it also, the staircase is very uh, attractive to me because there's no newel posts on the corners. Right. If you go into uh, to any house, you'll have to have a support at each corner to hold that stairway, uh, that uh, banister. Right. But John Rogers knew, he came from Baltimore, and he knew they were using this technique of casting spindles, mm -hmm. the part that holds the, the banister up, in metal. Mm -hmm. So he ordered these spindles from Baltimore. They came in, and then he had them reproduced in wood. So if you start up the stairway and you hit on it, you'll hear the wood sound, and then all of a sudden you'll hear a metal sound. Uh -huh. That's how we, that in the fact that That's the metal. That's how they do it. The metal doesn't hold paint very well, so the, they're peeling paint usually on the metal ones. I but see. But that again, that was the strength to make the Spanish to go from the first floor all the way up to the third floor. Mm -hmm. And it is, it winds around very beautifully. It's just that. gorgeous. Mm -hmm. it People really take is. photographs there. They also, uh, I've had a couple of weddings where they stand on the landing mm -hmm. and the minister uh, or whoever's oh. performing it. The bride and the groom and the minister of the wedding, and then the people are down here in the hallway uh -huh. sitting looking up because uh -huh. it's kind of neat. If it's not a very big wedding, that works really well. Yeah, I bet that's beautiful. Well, inside, these postcards we have are ba uh, dating from the 1940s. Mm -hmm. And even though the furniture that you see in is not there, the rooms are still just alike. This mm -hmm. is a dining room. And everyone loved the third floor. The third floor always had the children's yes. furniture on it. And wasn't that kind of uh, the way yes. it always was in most it was. Of the homes? Uh -huh. I know at the old Kentucky home, they said yeah. that the children were in that top floor. floor. Is that because they're so noisy? Or? No, well, I think it's... Um, combination of uh, the rooms usually were smaller than downstairs oh, okay. for one thing and they had servants and the servants could carry them up there and take care of them and uh -huh. uh, once they got to a certain age to behave themselves then they came down and the thing that we forget about they never had one child or one person to a bed there was right. always multiple so when you see a room and you'll say oh five people slept in here you're all thinking how can they do that well easy they just bundled up together and that's what you call spooning had, that's right and you had trundle beds and had cradles and everything else. Mm -hmm. But uh, the Wycliffe family was very active in politics. Uh, of course, Charles Wycliffe would be governor of Kentucky for one year in 1839. He went to Washington as the Postmaster General in 1841. And he took his older children with him up there. And his older children, Robert, who would later be governor of Louisiana, uh, he met his wife, mm -hmm. uh, who was the daughter of a Louisiana congressman, and that's how he ended up in Louisiana. Uh -huh. That way. And then uh, the daughters, Mary, would meet a lawyer from um, the Baltimore area. Uh -huh. um, 
nanny would meet the senator from Florida and fell in love with him, or he fell in love with her first. He finally talked her into marrying him after about 18 <laughs> months. He was something. And I'm really, that's one of the things I'm hoping to do now with this so-called retirement. Yes. I hope to write the story of Nanny and David Yuley because it's a wonderful love story and it's a great story about life during those times, 1840s, 50s, 60s. And uh, it, I was able to find uh, actual letters of the family back and forth. Because that's how they used to communicate. Oh, the only way. I, you know, I try to tell our kids that these mm. days because everything is either, if, if the most thing that they write is a text, mm -hmm. and of course that's all done with their thumbs. And, and it disappears. And so quick, and then it's gone. It's and gone. they say these snippets and snappets and Twitters and tweets and all the things that they're doing, but they're they're there and then they're gone. There is right. no history. Uh, how are we going to document all this? Of course, some of it maybe we don't want to document, but uh, surely there is some good, good to, to the social media and some of that is going to be preserved and obviously all the photographs but I know at the end of the year my Facebook pops up and says don't you want a book yeah. with all your the photographs, photographs in it which I just love because then it's all my favorite pictures from the whole year You've got and it puts it all in yeah. uh, you know numerical order it's in the order of the calendar well, year mm -hmm. and so of course you can do it anyway but that's the way I prefer it and uh, I, well, I love that. I'm one of those old dodos who don't we don't have Facebook <laughs> I, I don't tweet in uh, Twitter. <laughs> you don't tweet and tweet, tweet, tweet no, and Twitter Snapchat. Tweet. And no, I don't. I do well to get my email back. But anyway. Um, the only reason I Facebook is because uh, my daughter said you'll never see your grandchildren oh, again. If you, don't. if you don't. Because they can't post it five different places. Is, They're out of state and they want to post it one place okay. and then have everybody see there it. There you go. So. Well, there's, that's a good reason. I won't it is. Too. Uh -huh. Well, you were just talking about how history is preserved, and I'm going to jump right into that. That was a great lead-in. Great. Uh, this time of year, when you're visiting with your family, here mm -hmm. we've just had Christmas. Right. You probably heard your grandfather, grandmother tell a story about their Christmases, or maybe where they used to live and all. Right. And uh, I'm not talking just to... Um, 50 year olds, I'm talking right. to any age. Sure. A, a lot of times the grandchildren get more interested in your history than your own children because they think they know it. And they, they do. But they really don't know it because, it, uh, it, and I can attest to that, I forget that I did not tell my children everything because I was too busy trying to get them raised and fed and, and out the door. <laughs> they take care of them. Yeah. So I think that, uh, and I found that out in sharing things with my my grandchildren too. Uh, yeah. I thought they would know because their father should have told them. Well, it didn't yeah. happen. So yeah. what I'm leading up to is I want you to think about doing research. Now, this isn't research you're going to have a test on. This is going to be very rewarding research that you would be able to do locally. We have a tremendous amount of material in the genealogy room at the local public library right. on the Cathedral Manor. We also have uh, original records, which I love the original records. Mm -hmm. I'm not going to argue with Abraham Lincoln's father saying something I know. in a paper. I know. I'll argue with you if something's written up, but if I've got his paper saying this, I'm going to believe it. Right. But that said, we have that in our local records, the clerk's office, the county clerk, and the circuit clerk, and it's in the basement of the uh, the uh, annex, Sutherland Building, because that's where our oldest records are kept. All right, now, do you just walk in and start saying, I want to know about Sam Cecil or something? And uh -huh. Sam would forgive me for saying that. He, he was a wonderful <laughs> historian in bourbon history. Uh -huh. But you have to have a little background, and that's what you need to prepare yourself. Sit down with a note. Go get you a cheap notebook that you're not going to lose, big enough that you're not going to put it away and forget about it. Put down your, the information you know about you and your siblings, and then about your mother and father and their siblings, and then about the grandparents, and you just keep going up. You can take a page for everybody. It's, before you're finished, it's going to take two or three pages mm -hmm. for each person. Mm -hmm. But starting out, give everybody a page, and every time you learn something about it, where they went to school, where they were baptized, mm -hmm. maybe you don't know where they were baptized. In the genealogy room in the Barstown Library, they have church records. Uh, from churches all over Nelson County. They have burial records. They have birth records. There's just all kinds of vital statistics, as they say. Yes. Now, and it is manned. Uh, I'm not sure on Saturday if there's somebody there all day, but during the week and on Sundays, I think it might not be open. But if you go in and ask them to get you started and just say, this is the, my family name or my family names, there's always more than one, mm -hmm. uh, and then they might 
direct you. There may have been a book already written about the people in your family. You don't even know it. That's when you've hit the jackpot. Oh, boy. That's the lottery jackpot yeah. when it comes yeah. to genealogy. And in Nelson County, there are many families oh, that yes. have. That hey, I know I've seen a lot. Uh, yeah. when, and, and when we went through Nazareth, mm -hmm. they had all kinds of history things. Oh, yeah. Nazareth and, is a fabulous thing. Yes. And they're now, another do, resource. Yes. And particularly, if you get an, a hint that your mother or your great-grandmother might have gone to school at Nazareth, uh, they, they have the records from 1820 on up. Mm -hmm. Now, you just don't go in and start pulling through boxes and stuff. You've got to, again, get your information together, figure out what you're, you're the person you're looking for, mm -hmm. any information you have about it, and they have an archivist there that will help you. They have a lot of it already indexed and things like this. Now, I've written 16 books. Oh, my goodness, Dixie. Okay. I didn't know it was that many. <laughs> well... My 16 books are a result of loving to research. Mm -hmm. I love to dig to find out where's the rest of this story, What's, where else is the answer. And I brought these two things today just to show. <clears throat> these are two publications. <clears throat> this was done in 1904, the Kentucky Standard put it out. Mm -hmm. This was done in 1896, two different papers. <clears throat> I think it was competition. Yeah, oh, there you Probably. go. Probably. Yeah, we had two newspapers at one time. Oh, yes. We I had, did we had not three of us. Oh, yeah. <clears throat> this had been going on since the 1870s, the Nelson County record. When the standard started in 1900, this has been going on four years since this was done. Mm -hmm. The Nelson County record was still being printed. Finally, this quit, and this was the only one left, the, mm -hmm. the, Nelson, the Kentucky Standard. But what Which the, is still in is it <coughs> still today going, and yeah. still going strong and yeah. putting things out uh, well, every week. To give you some idea, <clears throat> see if you can find an ad in that one maybe. Okay. okay. These are individual little stories about these men. I have to say, they don't write much about women. They're not too <clears throat> impressed with the women, but they do call well, them. Well, what year is that? <laughs> that's, that's, yeah. that's probably why. I think there's, there's one lady in here who was the uh, assistant postmaster. Mm -hmm. you see her right there? I do. Mm -hmm. Beatrice Mann. These people all had something to do with Nelson County between 1800 and uh, 1896. And then you, this was called the historical section. Then you got into what they call the industrial section, which uh -huh. is over here. And this was all about, now here's the Gethsemane. Uh -huh. See that? Oh, that is beautiful. That's, That's a beautiful picture. And here's, a, here's a story about Gethsemane. Here's uh -huh. Dr. Williams, and this is my husband's great-grandfather right oh, there. Oh, my goodness. He was a doctor, too. Uh-huh. Uh, but this publication was done very well, and it lasted a long time. Now, industrial, we get to the distilleries. Mm -hmm. This is all uh, articles about little, uh, the 26 distilleries that were in this area in 1896. And yeah. this is 1896, right. okay. These are all distilleries and the people who were operating oh them. This gosh. is uh, Jim Beam's uncle, Jack Beam, and uh, Jim Beam's in here too, I think. James B. Beam. I'll have to see where he is, but anyway. These are the distilleries at New Hope, uh, at uh, Hunter's, uh, Mahoney's Distillery. Anyway, this was part of what they call their industrial. Now, why is it in this part? It's not in here at all. Uh -huh. The man, Sam Carpenter Elliott, right here, mm -hmm. who was the editor. Created it. Uh -huh. Yeah, the editor of the paper. He had been a federal agent or a uh -huh. uh, revenue agent, I guess you call it. Oh, really? All the distilleries had to have somebody from the government, so they made sure they paid the tax. Uh -huh. So they would go in, um, they called them storekeeper gaugers. And I think storekeeper was the idea that you're going to open and close the store. Engagers making sure that the number of gallons that they're taken out have the tax paid on them. Oh, okay. Well, from the Civil War on, we had storekeeper gaugers until about 1970-something. So all these new distilleries coming in aren't really new. Well, they are just replacing some of the they ones are replacing that some. pulled out during Prohibition. Well, they didn't pull out on purpose. They were closed up. Well, that's what I mean. But it was Prohibition that <laughs> Prohibition that. closed them. There were right. 12 operating distilleries here uh, in 1920. Okay. And when they reopened, tried to reopen, uh, which they did reopen some of them uh, in 1933, 34 and 35. 33 is when the last vote came about on, oh, wow. on repeal. In December, it came actually in March, but the, it had to be sent to all of the states and that when a majority of the states had agreed to it, that's when that's the right. December uh, yeah. date of repeal came about. Meanwhile, in Nelson County, we are out there desperately trying to rework our old distilleries and right. get them open. Right. 
And when I first started reading about that, I thought, my goodness, they got open so quick. This is December and this is March. Uh -huh. Well, then I went back and checked on it, and they had passed it in the previous March. So these distillers here knew it was going to pass. They knew it was going to pass. So they got pass. out and they checked their rusty pipes and, and their, their leaking roofs and their uh, warehouses to see how much whiskey was still left, and <laughs> no whiskey left. So it didn't take, didn't take too long. No. But, now, uh, you asked me about ads, yeah. and I, I see one here which I, I find very oh, interesting, interesting because obviously it's still open today. Yes, yeah, the banking and, house um, of Wilson & Muir, Bardstown. Mm -hmm. The cash capital is $100,000. When they life over that now? Yes. But in Bloomfield, we had Muir, Wilson & Muir, which was the same family, mm -hmm. and J. Hal Muir was a cashier. The liability of the stockholders is $200,000, gosh, and established in 1869. And that's what they just celebrated, you know. So yeah. very, very interesting, though, that we do have we right have down it. on a busy corner in downtown Bardstown. Right. There is the same bank that here, this was put 1904. out in 1904. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, already, wouldn't Frank be, be just be so, yes. so pleased? We should, we should show him this sometime. I bet he'd be, yeah, there we go. you know, thrilled to, to see that. And that they were still doing marketing and oh, advertising. Yes, yes. And I just, uh, Wilson Muir is such a good supporter of the community as a mm -hmm. whole and not just in the banking industry but everything Anything else right yes mm -hmm. this picture which you cannot see very clearly but this is the western end of the courthouse it's in the court uh, the court square mm -hmm. and this is a meeting of teachers these are the Nelson County's Teachers Association mm -hmm. now they're not meeting to uh, protest anything there's no <laughs> signs or anything they they would get together once or twice a year and my husband had a cousin who was here I think here and uh -huh. his grandfather is up in here, right here, and her, his sister, my um, his great grand, no, his grandfather and his aunt, great aunt, were both school teachers, and mm -hmm. they're both in this picture. Now, I'm not bragging about any of this. I'm just trying to let you know what you might find when you start looking at these old publications, and just how interesting yes. that is to your family. That's right. And pictures like these, you may not have any of these pictures. This is the man who was putting out the, the newspaper at the time, J. S. Wilson. J.S. Wilson took lots and lots of photographs, mm -hmm. and you'll still find him on postcards. If you look around, you'll find old postcards, and if it has J.S. Wilson on the bottom, he died in 1922, so we know the picture had to be made before 1922. Mm -hmm. This is the old Grigsby's building, and this building is still being used today. Uh, you've got the uh, Barbara's decorating. You've got this building's been turned into something else. Let's see. I think this is her uh, Croom drugstore drug right store. here. Yeah. Mm -hmm. This is the old And look at how young some of these people oh, yeah. look in the in the pictures too. Because a lot of times when you think, well, it's it's old, they're going to look old. They don't look old. They were young once too, and uh, and had a bright right. future and all kinds of things. Well, they talk about Mil Milheiser and Company Druggists. Let me tell you a story about Mr. Milheiser. Uh, and. For a while in Bardstown, we had three drugstores. Uh -huh. I don't know how many we have now, but then we had three. Well, they determined there wasn't enough business here for three drugstores. So they were going to draw straws, and the person with the sh short straw was going to move out of town. Oh, my God. Mr. Milhauser got the short straw. Aww. I think he went to Springfield. He did. Okay. Well, at, did. Least, at least he still had his business. There, yes. Still had his business. But that's the sort so. of thing. This is the school, the Bardstown Co-Educational College. This mm -hmm. is down on South 3rd Street. It was yep. torn down in 1910 after the Bardstown Public School was built. The private schools did not have as many students. Yeah. And this building was yeah. torn down, and a woman took the, the lady who owned the property, Ms. Baldwin, took the materials from that school and built two houses, which are still down there on the 200 oh block goodness. of South 3rd. Well, and I love them repurposing things. Oh, yeah. Uh, you know, yeah. instead of just destroying yeah. it. Well, yeah, we didn't much. We've always repurposed things. Right. right. I and think there's so many communities that do not oh, do that. Oh, well, we have, I think part of it, we never had enough money to tear it all down, build it new, <laughs> which has some advantage, too. And I think, too, we had family yes. buildings that people wanted to save. And we right. had, right. I think the fact we had such good architecture here, just wonderful mm -hmm. architecture. And maybe John Rogers, I think he set a standard for us when he was here. Mm -hmm. He was only here until 19, 1836, uh, which should have been 22 years or something. His standard, his buildings were so beautiful, people started realizing that this is the standard of architecture they wanted. Right. And then right. he trained people, apprentices, in plaster work and in woodworking and all. So we had this great group of builders here, and they just kept building. Mm -hmm. These are churches. Uh, this church actually is in, in Chaplin. This is the Methodist Church at 2nd and Flagey, mm -hmm. Presbyterian on North 2nd. 
and of course St. Joseph Cathedral. All still standing. All still standing. All still mm -hmm. standing and I think that is you know yeah. such a testament to his work and just the craftsmen and the people that really really, really cared it. about their yeah. community because right. I used to hear that all the time. Yeah. Our community doesn't do that. They didn't you know all those yeah. buildings were tore down years ago. I know. And, and maybe needed to be, so. Well, you must have take care of These are all in Bloomfield. We have Bloomfield, Chaplin, and Boston in here. Let's see about Boston, because okay. Boston gets overlooked a lot, I think. Okay. Yeah, but you know, if you're a, yeah, here we go. If you're a native of Boston, now here's another, Joseph B. Borders. Now he's a special edition editor. He's here in the newspaper, Mr. Borders. Mm -hmm. And this is the engraving company that did a lot of the engraving for the magazine. This is the uh, Boston Church. Baptist Church and the Christian Church. And I have a photograph I found years ago that didn't work that has two, you can see three churches in one shot. And oh, I don't know where oh, you go that you're gonna find three churches, three churches in one photograph. In one shot. Yeah, and this is a mercantile bu building down there. Uh, and what's our ad over there? This okay. is engraving. Oh, That's okay. part, of, part of the engraving for this. The engraving. There's the Boston Bank. Uh -huh. And now, why isn't everything there? Boston flooded and it burned. It had at least two or three fires and it flooded almost every other year, you know, where oh it is. My gosh. But that's why today we don't think, there's another picture here. Mm -hmm. See, here's the Sprig Warehouse. The Sprig family name is still around. Mm -hmm. And over here, um, this family, let's see. Oh, this is the saloon in uh, the hotel. William Darty's, um, what they said, cafe, no. Yeah, it is. The view of the bar in William Darty's Cafe. Someone told me that that bar is now in New Haven at the Sherwood Inn. I have no idea if it is or not. Oh. Somebody may have seen it and saw it somewhere yeah. else. We're repurposing, remember? I know. <laughs> I love that. I love that. I know going through Talbot's Tavern, uh, you know, Kathy Kelly was telling mm -hmm. us a lot of the things that they had repurposed there mm -hmm. or moved even from one room Move to, to another, the other right. and exchanged things, but always found a use yeah. for them. If there was anything possible, they would definitely find a use for I want that, you to look so. at J. Robert Crew. This mm -hmm. is the busy cut rate druggist. The busy cut, cut, rate. cut rate druggist. This is the man. I knew him when he was old, old, old. Mm -hmm. uh, I knew his son, Dr. Keith Crew, but I and he was on the corner of Third of, uh, Street and Flaget, where Edward D. Jones is today. Mm -hmm. And I have three of the cabinets that he had in there oh, wow. when it was uh, cleared out in 1986. Uh -huh. I ended up with three of the big display cabinets mm -hmm. in that. So I feel real close to the J. Robert Cream Drugstore. Yes. The, and this is Samuel Rodman, who again is my husband's cousin, some way or other. Nashville Railroad, here's the depot. And today, they have torn off part of the depot, the wooden part that was on one end where only the stone shows, but that shows what it was like in 1904. And back here, it's the Cardin Drug Company of New Haven. This is the, the Tonso Remedy Co Company. I don't know what Tonso is, but that's what it says. <laughs> but you have uh, advertising. Oh, what a wonderful piece. You had to have advertising to pay for this, just you like did. today. Just, just like today, mm -hmm. that's, that's what pays for it, to put it together. Right. And I, I love all the different pieces in there that have such historical value. There you go. And people that have an appreciation for it, like yourself, uh, I love looking at things like that. I know I, I have a picture of my mom with her family mm -hmm. and my little granddaughter was looking at that and she said that can't be your mom and I said it is my mom and I said it's when she was little and she said she was little she was little <laughs> she was a child and it was like you know I mean she was she was young at the age and yeah. she just didn't the whole concept Deptive. of that yes I, I my mom was you young one like time you. and yes. it, it's just so interesting to me like you, you said share those stories yeah. with your grandchildren because if they haven't heard them from their own parents uh, they might never know some of the little uh, mm -hmm. you know well, tidbits that you you can tell Even, that they don't know. Right. Then something else is a little more serious, too. Share your health history. Share mm -hmm. the history of what you know about mm -hmm. your family. Today Very we realize good. the uh, weakness we have. If you have had, uh, I had a grandmother that had breast cancer, but my, the other problem I had, my father had uh, colon cancer, my mother had cancer, but both my parents had heart problems. Mm -hmm. And uh, there again, you can talk about diet and cancer and all, but if you don't know that you've got, I call it a weakness, mm -hmm. or a, in, in your genes for things like that, then you, you don't pay attention to tests and things like that. And once that you find out that's a possibility, and there are many families who have propensity to colon cancer, mm -hmm. it's just right there. Uh, but that's something if caught early, you don't have to die of colon no. cancer. 
But well, and what about this DNA testing? I really, I've, I've kind of wondered about that, and I've thought I don't know if it's a good idea or not. I don't know if I, I really want to know. No, I think you, in terms of where you came from, right? Yeah, right. Well, uh, I like my history. I guess I'd like to keep it that way. Well, again, oral history which is what we're talking about doing now, passing right. something down. Right. I'm sure that I am Scotch-Irish from Eastern Kentucky, but I don't know exactly. I do know. I have some German in me because I've gone back to Germany on mm -hmm. one line and things. But there again, it's interesting that all that melting pot of things, right. that they can figure this out. I don't yeah. know how they figure it out. <laughs> I don't I, know if uh, they do. Uh, I, I, well, obviously it works on some level because they're able to well, get details. Well, there's so much information now you can find. When I was doing research 30 years ago about family, uh, I should have gone to Salt River, Salt River, Salt, Salt Lake, uh, Utah, because uh -huh. they have, the Mormons they have do. tremendous, they uh, do. tremendous, and they've done a wonderful job all over the world copying things. So, and they've filmed it in microfilm and stuff to help people. But that said, if a family, if it's a family story, take mm -hmm. it all down right. and with a uh, grain of salt. You, someone may have said, oh, uh, my grandfather was a lieutenant in the Civil War and he fought for the South. Okay. Uh -huh. well, your grandfather might have been a private in the Civil War and he might have been driving a wagon. It doesn't make any difference. He's your grandfather and whatever he did, you want to know what it is. Sure. But that, all that said is get your documentation when you can and make it fit with the story. If it doesn't fit, then start looking some more. Now that's really interesting because we, we just did uh, a piece on World War II uh, just last week and part of that was all the medals that my father oh. had earned during World War II yeah. that were lost. I mean, we had four kids, yeah. we moved, yeah. you know, went a lot of different places and these were all back when he was in the war. Mm -hmm. And so my husband got online and went through the Veterans Administration and went and he was able to not only, they were able to look up his records, mm -hmm. find out every, I knew that he had won a Purple Heart, mm -hmm. and he had it on a keychain oh. at the oh. time, and he oh. sold the car and left it on the keychain, key chain. and my mom was just distraught because she said that Purple Heart was really something yeah. near and dear to our family, yeah. and my husband went online, looked up all those things, and I had the whole case of all the medals, and we were very impressed that my father had earned that many medals yeah, sure. from some of his details of what went on during the war, didn't include a lot of, of yeah. medals. A lot of the heroes. A lot of the heroes. Heroism, yeah. but a lot of times our, our people in the war, our soldiers, do minimize mm -hmm. the, oh, yeah. the risks that they took and what they went through right. because they don't want to share those stories with their mm -hmm. children and maybe don't want to remember it just that way. Mm -hmm. But he was injured, received a Purple Heart, and did come home. So so we were glad for that, but uh, other than that, we really didn't know a lot of the about history it. of the war. The other thing that I failed to mention at the uh, genealogy room, they yeah. have microfilm. Uh, okay. And they have microfilm of the Kentucky Standard and some of the earlier uh, newspapers. They have some microfilm of the 1836, Western Protestant, oh, the uh, I didn't lo that. local papers. Yes, the Historical Society has some yeah. of those papers. But by putting them on film, you can sit and look at them on the screen and you can copy them. At your leisure. Yes, yes. And right now, they have digitized, is the word they use, uh, where if you're looking, like I want to go look up about William Douglas, who was. Uh, uh, David Beam's driver, you okay. know, okay. I can put in William Douglas, and if it's on a sheet, I mean, I'm looking at a newspaper from 1922. Okay. All right, I'm looking at a certain week, and if that man's name is in there that week, it'll be highlighted. I won't have to read every page. Yeah. You can do the same thing. You can do that with obituaries, with just any newspaper articles aren't all about death and dying and right, right. but they'll say people win awards basketball team anybody that's interested in writing a history of the basketball uh, the baseball teams baseball teams here in Bardstown please yeah. contact me I want somebody to write this there's a great great amount of information about our local baseball teams now I'm talking 1890s 1920s 1930s we and it could easily be done from the newspapers because mm -hmm. during the summer and I always yeah. often said, we quit making whiskey, and we, we didn't quit drinking it, but we quit making it and selling it. <laughs> but we kept going to baseball games all the summer, 22, 23, 24, uh -huh. 25. Our local team was like a semi-pro team. Uh -huh. And I know everybody thinks I'm exaggerating, but if you read the front page of every issue from May to September, mm -hmm. had what was going on with the baseball team. Mm -hmm. And at one point during Prohibition, uh, we were playing Glasgow. Well, Glasgow was a heap away. I mean, today it's an hour and a, almost an hour and a half, hour plus. 
But then they could take the train, mm -hmm. maybe, but so many people just couldn't get there. So what they did, the local, uh, what they call the sweet shop, they had a telephone line that they paid for, and they had a reporter in Glasgow at the game, uh -huh. and he was telling the people in Bardstown what was going on at the game. It was a broadcast over a telephone line. Oh, my God. And everybody in the Isn't Switch Shop was something? listening. Yeah, that's the kind of fans we still have in Kentucky. You know, the we crazy. do yes. still have yeah. fans like that in Kentucky. But this was something I think was so neat, and I, I'd be glad to help anybody get started and find the information, but I just can't write it. I've got too many things I have to do. Let but, me see if I can't find someone. Well, if somebody that, to do that has that kind of thing. Well, but they have that loyalty and that well, you interest, know, the interest. interest, and they would really like to do. I actually have some of mine, so I'm well, gonna we ha we check have that out. White teams and we have black teams. Mm -hmm. We and it's again, it it's a capsule story about entertainment. Uh, working together, sure. uh, and these are not you know, high school students, these are adults. These are men out of school, even though some of them probably did play when they were high school. Yeah. But that this was a team that was well looked up to, and there are many people in the community whose families played in these teams. That that, they say you can tell a lot about a family or a, a, any group of people by handing them a newspaper and yeah. see which where they where go. They go to do they go yeah. to the front page to see yeah. what the news is or what's the latest thing? Do they go to the sports page immediately? Uh, I go immediately to the comics. I do too. <laughs> <laughs> and, and we got up on a Sunday morning and everyone's sitting around and, and relaxing and, and we were drinking a cup of coffee and uh, her husband brought the newspaper in, which at that time was about that, that, this that, bit. Yeah. And he divided it up and he took the front page because he wanted to know what the news was. My husband took the sports section because he yeah. wanted to know what the sports were. Right. And my girlfriend wanted to look at all the ads, ads, which on Sunday, you know, there's a big stack of ads in there. And uh, I said, well, that's fine. I just want to read the funnies anyway. That's and right. She said, I, I can't believe you do that. And I said, there is so much turmoil and, and I, I get enough bad news. Mm -hmm. I would really, really like to see something that's going to make me laugh and, mm -hmm. and just... That's right. You know, that's, and it doesn't that's a take, lot of good things. So. It doesn't take long to read them. And no, you kind it doesn't take long. But, uh, you know, a big problem now is that they make that print so small. Do you ever they feel do. like they're making the print too they small? Do. Uh, I used to hear the older people, listen to me, older yes. people, uh, fussing about things being made too small. And now that I'm getting there where I can't read the <laughs> medicine bottle, and I have really good glasses that take care of myself, yes. but man, it's small stuff. So. It, well, they do, and I think sometimes, I, I look on there, like if you have to read 800 number yeah. or something, yeah. I, I don't think they could get it much smaller. And I mean, you, you really do have to mm -hmm. strain to, you know, to get to see that, but. Um, don't be, I also, I really want to encourage people not to get discouraged and don't think okay. you have to read uh, the script, the cursive, because a right. lot of the threat records have been transcribed and printed and if you do or come digitized. across yes if you do come across something you can't read a deed or a marriage certificate or something there are people that will help you that are used to reading it mm -hmm. i don't want you to get discouraged but i also don't want you to think you're going to go in there and come out 2 hours later with your whole family history, history. it doesn't work that way no. but they do have the censuses all over and they have i mean uh, every 10 years you have a census we have Kentucky census we have Nelson County right uh, if you come from somewhere else they also have the, the different counties around here, and they can also show you how to get on the, the national list to find things. So it's a great, great hobby is the word I use, and it's something you can take up and put down. It's if something you, fun, though. Oh, something yes. Something fun and interesting. It's like finding diamonds yes. when you find out where this yes. one happened and that. Yes, that way. So I hope if you, uh, if you have the interest, go to the Nelson County mm -hmm. Library or the Nelson County Clerk's office uh, downstairs in their uh, their deed room in that area. All my old records are kept down there. But again, I have found it very fulfilling for many years. Well, we yeah. are very fortunate, Dixie, to have someone like you with the historical background, but also with your level of interest, and then also the ability to sit down and write it down mm. and retain all that information. So we sure appreciate you joining us today. You're welcome. And if anyone has any questions or anything, I'm not going to hand your number up. Well, thank you. But they can <laughs> contact us, and uh, we'll see if we can't get those questions answered for you. So thank you so much. You're welcome. And uh, have a great day. Thank you.